Okay, so welcome to uh, week three. So what's your feelings of the unit so far? Uh, not too bad, just a lot of information to cover. There is a lot of information. Uh, it's not your typical kind of accounting unit, is it? No, not really. No. What about you, Susan? Yeah, I find that it's, um, yeah, a lot of theory stuff gets you away from the numbers, but, you know, it's still confusing yeah. somewhat as well. Yep. <laughs> well, it is theory. That's the name of it, I guess. Um, and it is designed to get you away from the numbers. Um, personally, I think um, this is this is what makes accounting really interesting. Uh, this kind of thing is what gets you away from the bookkeepers. Uh, because... Um, a lot of people, even accountants in practice, they think accounting is simply summing up the numbers. You know, you've got an accounting information system that records all your transactions. And then all you've got to do is press the button, sum it all up into the proper accounts and publish it. Well, there's a lot more to that. If, if, that's, all it, if that's all it was, then you wouldn't need a, a three-year degree to get to there. Um, so there's a lot of technical information that you've got to learn in your accounting degree um, and it does focus on the numbers uh, but you know, is, maybe it's a bit of a stretch but think of this as a holiday away from the drudge okay this is your Bahamas holiday where you get to exercise the brain and do some really really interesting stuff so what have you encountered so far in the in weeks one two or three that's interesting Please let me, please say there's something interesting in there. Silence. Come on, Nicholas. Um, I don't know. I guess the just general differences between uh, international standards and American standards, especially yep. they uh, like the, to keep their domestic policies rather than uh, introduce more uh, international standards. Yeah. And that's just so America, isn't it? They're just so big over there that they can do whatever they like. Do you think, do you think they're on a winner or a loser with this one? Uh, probably a loser, I would assume. Because yeah. it affects international uh, companies a lot. Uh, yeah. It certainly does. I mean, the world is a lot more connected now, isn't it? And that means that capital flows a lot easier across national borders. So what that means for you and me is that it's much more, e it's much easier now than it might have been 20 years ago, for instance, to invest directly into Singapore or Hong Kong or India or even in the UK if you're coming from Australia. And, of course, it's easier to get investment into Australia if, if you've got the right product. So money flows much easier now. And that means that accounting skills and accounting knowledge has to flow along with it. Because accountants really are the gatekeepers for capital. We speak the language. So given that capital is becoming more global now, it makes sense that uh, the, the language that we speak, which is, you, know, you understand that we speak English, don't you? I'm not being silly here. But when you, we speak English, right, we've got a grammar, haven't we? A grammar, a grammar sets how we put words together and, and phrase them in ways that another reader of English can understand it. So our accounting standards are the grammar for the language of accounting. So what we've got here is uh, a situation where uh, an international set of accounting standards mean that we can speak the same language. So an accountant in Australia can speak directly to an accountant in the UK. And of course you say, well, that's obvious because we all speak English. But as accountants, we speak the numbers, we speak the flow of capital. And so this is important. So if you read my little email today, um, it, it's all, that, that's what we're all about this week. So internationalisation of the accounting standards is really good news uh, for a young fellow like you, Nicholas. Not so great news for an old bloke like me because I'm quite set in my ways and I'm staying right here. 
but if you want to get on a jet when you get your degree and go to Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Paris, go for it. The skills you learn right here, right now, uh, put you on that jet. How about you, Susan? Do you find that interesting, or do you find that attractive? You're gonna you're gonna follow the money to London. Oh well, that's probably yeah, and um aberration of mine that I'd probably like to do, but I've got a few more years on me than Nicholas, I think. <laughs> oh, that's you and me both. <laughs> it's embarrassing that he's so young. Okay. Unlike you, Susan, I get to meet him in the classroom. I get to smack him around the ears a bit in the, in the classroom as well. <laughs> he's even younger in the classroom than he appears on video. <laughs> How old will you be when you uh, graduate, Nicholas? Uh, 20. 20. See, there should be a law against that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so enough paying out on Nicholas. <laughs> so there's real, you know, there's, there's benefit. Of course, if you just want to do accounting in Australia in your hometown like Rockhampton or Bundaberg, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, um, and I'm, you know, I'm living proof of that. Uh, but, of course, we've got options now. Um, a young accountant's leaving now. I have a, a very good friend. Um, when she graduated, she got a double degree in accounting and information technology from CQU. And she did her chartered accountant's uh, professional, professional work, got her chartered accountant's designation and promptly got on a, literally got on a jet and went to London. And I'm not sure where she is now, but I think just a year ago, she uh, finished up as something like the CFO of Heathrow International Airport. So that's pretty good going, I think, for a Rocky graduate. Yeah. And there's stories like that um, all over the place. Uh, my, you know, given that, You've got to accept right now that I'm a seriously old bloke, uh, but I've got lots of older brothers. My second oldest brother, who's still working, uh, was in, I think, the second cohort that ever joined the old CIAE 50 years ago that became the university. He did his business studies, became a CPA, and he's still working as, I think he's the, he's the chief executive officer of... Oh, what is that, the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. And if you're going to give me a hard time tonight, I'm going to require that you write all that out. So he runs a professional society similar to CPA Australia, only is for anaesthetists, not for accountants. So you, you get a good education here. Uh, and accounting is... It's going to take you wherever you want, want to go. So what I really want to get out of this unit is to open your eyes to it goes way beyond the numbers. And you're going to come across some, some fairly drudge things, I guess. Um, for me, um, my eyes start to glaze over whenever you start to talk about valuation of assets and historical costs versus fair value. Um, for me, that I mean that doesn't turn my lights on, but it's it's also very important because uh, you're going to come up again across you're going to come across this later in this term, and the valuation of assets is how accountants see the firm. So think about it: if if you're a, a professional marketer, you see a firm as its brand. If you're a HR professional, you see a firm as its people, wouldn't you? If you're an accountant, you see the firm as the sum of its assets. So if you change how assets are valued, then you change the firm. So it's, it's very, very important. That's coming ahead of you. Um, um, in the meanwhile, you know, I've slipped some uh, fairly strange bits of research in. So in... Uh, week one, I think you've got a couple of strange research articles to have a look at. Did either of you download them and have a read? 
Oh, no. Nicholas, come on. <laughs> yes, I've downloaded them and read them and it confused me just as much because I read the textbook, read the, um, the journals that you had for us to read and with the workshop question that you had, uh, one of them in relation to those journals, I was sort of confused of what or how to look at it. Maybe it was I wasn't getting the right understanding out of the journals when I was reading them. All right, for a start, let me just say, of course, it's early days uh, and they're both very advanced. So you're not expected to give a full critique of those journal articles. Uh, so off the top of your mind, uh, Susan, give us a bit of a, what's the first thing that came into your head as you read those? Well, that they were talking about the the history of you know the normative um, theory of accounting, and also the other one I think was addressing the positive um, theory of accounting. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, I sort of got that much out of it. And then one of the questions that you had on that workshop was to to look at what the um, what what it was saying to you sort of thing is what I thought that it what what I was supposed to get out of it. Yeah. But um, it yeah with with it saying about the normative theory accounting, I was I I felt that there was a little bit of both in both journals. Yeah. Well, there there could be um, because I mean norm normative theory permeates all through financial accounting theory. And that's because, you know, our um, conceptual framework and the accounting standards, they're all classic examples of normative theories. So anything that says, uh, you shall do this, or you should do this, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a normative view of the world. You know, some smart guy somewhere has said, this is what accounting should look like. So that, that's where the word normative comes from. It's a view of what should be normal. Now, you're allowed to take uh, issue with that and you say, no, that's not particularly normal. Uh, and accounting, the discipline of accounting can thrive when you have a lot of different uh, opinions being expressed about um, are those accounting standards, for example, really representing reality? And so you can appreciate that accounting standards, for example, are not set in stone. There are discussions going on all the time about whether an accounting standard is an appropriate standard. And so they change all the time. Over time, some get dropped and new ones come on board to replace them or existing ones are modified. So just like we as accountants can be fairly complex characters uh, and even cranky characters sometimes, uh, so too are accounting standards. So that's what normative theory is all about. Now that um, positive accounting theory, and we're going to uh, meet that later in the term, uh, in, uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on it. So positive accounting theory is, as I suggested, it's, it's, it's a positive or positivist style of research. Uh, and if you've ever heard of science or the scientific method, that's classic positivist research. And it's very, very different to the normative style. So the normative style is very much, you should do this because we think it's a good idea. Whereas uh, positive theory uh, isn't interested at all about what you should or shouldn't do, what's right or what's wrong. It's more interested in predicting what you will do given a certain set of circumstances. So it does a completely different kind of job. Uh, and positive accounting theory, or PAT, as the name of the theory itself, um, is really concerned about trying to predict what 
managers will do concerning accounting theory, or sorry, not accounting theory, accounting policy in their firm, uh, given particular circumstances. So they might, for example, if it suits their own self-interest, they might choose to revalue assets upwards, which would give them a boost to their revenue, which will increase profits and which will increase their own management bonuses. Or if they find their interests are better served by not posting massive big profits, uh, for example, you could imagine if you're a senior executive in an Australian bank, the news is running um, headline after headline about bank executives being paid millions in bonuses while they rake in billions of dollars of profit. Have you heard news articles like that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So imagine if you're a bank executive and you've just seen the draft financial report and it says, billions and billions of dollars in profit. And you're going, uh, this is not going to go down well with the public or with the government or with the tax office. So what they might do is they might devalue some of their assets and, hey, presto, that big profit disappears. So they don't get the bonuses, but they don't get the public caning either. So that's what a positive theory like positive accounting theory tries to do. It tries to predict what will happen, but it makes no judgment about whether that's right or wrong. You're starting to see the difference there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I had a little bit of fun with the, um, the second journal article uh, from week one, and it's, it's actually not a... Uh, a normative theory. It's actually an interpretive style of theory. Uh, and it says, oh, let's look at um, an accounting standard and start interpreting like uh, like it's a novel. Let's start reading it like it's literature. So you haven't had the background or the tools to really get the messages out of that yet. Uh, so why did I put them up there for week one. Well, I want to. I want you to start reading alternative views about accounting, right from the word go. Yes, it's difficult to understand, uh, but if you start to work out that there's lots of different views about the profession of accounting, uh, the sooner you get to that realization, I think, the better. And Granted, there are going to be ways of seeing accounting that you just don't get or you disagree with or you're just not interested in. But hopefully somewhere in this unit, you'll find something that says, hey, that's a really interesting way of looking at accounting. And if, if that little light bulb comes on, then the chances are you're going to sign up to a very interesting career. Because I have to say, there are many accountants who go, from graduation right through to retirement without ever having to think about their profession and what it is that they do. They're just summing up the financial reports and pressing the publish button, having to fight with some auditors here and there, but they don't really get what their profession's all about. So if you can develop an inquiry, inquiring mind about what accounting is and what it does, then what I'm trying to do here is to develop you as a future professional so that you can take that out into your profession. So that's all high-minded, I know. But that's what I was trying to do with uh, those two journal articles, to get you thinking about something that's different. Um, another, while we're on module one, uh, I've just went through the differences between positive theory and normative theory. Uh, would you agree that the conceptual framework is a normative theory?
Come on, Nicholas, I'm going to lob this one to you. Um, I'm not uh, entirely sure, sorry. Uh... Well, a normative theory uh, is one that tells you what you should do. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say yes then. Yep, yeah, and you'd be right. So, conceptual framework is classic normative theory. Uh, see, in terms, as it turns out, the normative, uh, sorry, the conceptual framework is a theory. And so are the accounting standards. They offer a particular view of the world. And Nicholas, I know we're working together through the auditing unit. So those auditing standards are also normative theories. So they tell you what you should do. Um, and personally, I think that's, what's, that's what makes them so dreary to read sometimes. Um, yes, you can. T you, they tell you what you should do so that you don't end up in trouble with the profession. But they're not particularly interesting to read. Uh, I'm yet to find anyone who says, oh, well, I love reading that conceptual framework. I'm going to give it another go tonight. It's really exciting. Every time I read it, I'll find something different. Yep, said no account ever. So they are useful. They're not particularly interesting to read. Uh, but the important thing about conceptual frameworks are they are much more uh, susceptible to change. So they are very dynamic. I don't suppose anyone remembers what the two branches of um, decisional... De uh, decision usefulness theories are, can they? Uh, no. Uh, how about you, Susan? You want to have a crack at that one? I'm not really sure. I'd have to be guessing if I was, you know, I could have it all muddled up thinking because um, with the induction and de deductive and in deductive and inductive is the words that come to my mind but that could be with another theory <laughs> where right, I yes. confuse all, right. all the different theories so yeah <laughs> all right well, I'll come to that one in just a moment so the accounting standards and the conceptual framework are all about decision usefulness so in other words that the, the accounting standards should result in uh, financial reports that assist in making financial decisions make sense Yep. Okay, so there's two ways you could go about it. Um, there's a decision maker's emphasis, which emphasis, which tends to focus more on us as the decision makers. So what makes us think? So later in the term, we're going to come up against some psychological models about how people process information. But the more common method that you'll find, this is what you'll find in the conceptual framework, is the decision models emphasis. And this is all about um, how the researchers, uh, uh, sorry, how, how, um, how we can present things in a way that will uh, enhance decision making. So in other words, if you uh, read a balance sheet, so it doesn't matter if it's a balance sheet of Qantas or a balance sheet out of a you know, small to medium enterprise. They're all on a single page and you'll find that the um, important items at roughly the same location on that page. So that's part of uh, the decision model approach. So it's more about how we present the information. What sort of models do we use to present that information to allow a decision maker to make financial decisions? How are we going there? Yes, these are pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, so important thing is, uh, when you go through these modules, uh, when you get come up against things that where you're really stuck, um, you can use Moodle to post something in the uh, discussion uh, or the question and answer uh, bulletin board, or you can email me directly. So don't hang on thinking about something and you know, getting frustrated uh, that you can't work out what it is. Don't carry that on into the term. If 
you can't work it out, let me know. Ask a question on the Q&A uh, or send me an email. Okay? Okay. Yeah. All right, so quick turn over to module two. Uh, what do we do in module two? Well, we looked at the um, uh, regulatory environment. We focused it on uh, Australia, didn't we? Yeah. So there's quite a few active players in the regulatory environment in Australia. Uh, we've got a st uh, our standard setter. So in Australia, it's the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Internationally, we have the International Accounting Standards Board. Now, they pitch their standards to produce financial reports for, obviously, people who will use the financial statements to make uh, financial decisions. What sort of person do you think the standard setters think are reading those, sta those uh, financial statements? What assumptions are we making about the users of our financial reports? That they have some knowledge of accounting or business the yeah. figures and what they mean, but a yeah. lot of people don't have that understanding. Yes. Uh, do you think they're pitching it at um, account people who have graduated with an accounting degree? No, more so just um, business owners where they would just have very basic business accounting knowledge. Yep. So there's an assumption made right there that uh, we don't actually know who's going to read the financial statements, so we've got to make assumptions. So they're making the assumption that the average reader will have at least some basic knowledge of business and financial principles. You don't have to be an accountant, but you do have to bring something to the table. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I agree. Yep. So. If they made the assumption that only qualified accountants would read financial reports, what sort of things, how, how do you think they would structure a financial report in that case? Any ideas? I reckon it'd be a lot more technical, wouldn't it? There'd probably be pages of it. You know, this would be like, I'm an accountant, you're an accountant, let's just talk our language and forget about everybody else. Yeah. Imagine that sort of conversation, it'd be pretty drear, wouldn't it? So that's it. So that's the basic assumption that standard setters make, and that drives the language of the entire conceptual framework and the resulting accounting standards. So it's an important assumption. Now here's a question from the workshop. Things such as profit, that gets a lot of coverage in the media. Do you think that's fair? Do you think the idea of profit is something that's really set in stone? It's, it's an easily defined concept and it's an easily defined number on the, on the financial statement? You might only show uh, a certain perspective for readers. Yeah. yeah the, the problem with profit is it, it seems easy enough to define. You know, simply what's left over after you deduct your expenses from your revenue, correct? Yeah. Easy? Yeah. Okay, so this appeals to the people who think accounting is nothing more than adding up the numbers and summarising it into different categories. But the reality is there is it, profit, the, 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 what we call the bottom line, profit is probably the most easily manipulated number in the entire financial report. Now I'm not talking about dodgy accounting, I'm not talking about creative accounting. I'm talking about 
completely within the rules of the accounting standards and the law. It's got to be the most easily manipulated number. Because if you've got a high, uh, a high profit, that means you've got a high tax bill. If you don't want that, then you write down a whole bunch of assets and there goes your profit. On the other hand, if you want bonuses for meeting um, your investors' expectations, then you can revalue assets up, for example, and up goes your income. And correspondingly, up goes your profits. All of that is allowed for in the accounting standards. So, you know, the, the, um, the media tends to focus on the profit, the bottom line. And I don't know if that they do the invest, investment uh, community a lot of service, especially uh, amateur investors. Interestingly, I read once from uh, Warren Buffett, you heard of him? One of the richest men in the world. He makes his living out of investing, investing in companies. And he said when he gets the financial report from a company he's considering to invest, he does not take any notice of the profit line. The first thing he looks at is the cost of goods sold. Because for him, that tells him the cost of goods sold relative to the gross profit or to relative to income uh, is really a good indication of how efficient that company is. So I think if nothing else out of this unit, you'll get an idea that uh, things such as uh, profit, uh, they're quite illusory. And we're going to look at different perspectives of accounting. Uh, so you should be moving away from the idea that accounting is uh, simply objective and it comes up with hard numbers that you can't really dispute. Of course you can dispute them. Accountants have a lot of decision-making power. Now, one of the questions from module two are, is, uh, do you think it's realistic to expect that accountants are always objective? And Nicholas, we had a similar discussion about auditors, didn't we? Uh, yeah. So what, what do you reckon the answer of that would be? That they uh, are always objective. Uh, yeah. you'd, uh, you'd want them to be, but there's still the possibility that they are not going to be. Yes. So to be purely objective means that you can completely leave your own personality, who you are, out of your decision. You focus on nothing but the facts, apparently. So that's a desire. If you, if you believe in objectivity, you think that's a desirable thing. But do you think that's really possible? What about you, Susan? No, it's not completely possible, but it um, you can do that to a certain degree, but not completely. Um, yeah. Sure. Sure. So, um, so you can aim to be objective, but I think it's not possible to leave who we are out of the decision-making process, is it? No, uh, not to, uh, it would only be to a certain extent. All right, let's talk about some of the, the really interesting stuff. So when we talk about um, regulation of financial reporting, we looked at a couple of theories of, about uh, whether and the economy should be regulated at all, or should it be more regulated? What do you What do you guys think? What about you, Nicholas? Do we have too much regulation, or not, not enough, or is it just right? Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not too sure. It appears to be going pretty fine. So I would assume that it's uh, enough regulation. Okay. What about you, Caesar? 
I would say that there's probably some areas that need more regulation because some big companies find the loopholes and that's how they, you know, like for instance with the um, taxes that some companies that are over that are international, how they skip out on paying tax in Australia because they pay it overseas, you know, things like that. That's where regulation probably is a shortfall. Okay, so you're a, you're a pro regulator. Yes. And Nicholas is sort of in the middle. So what's at the other what's at the other end, Susan? Your pro regulation. What does anti regulation look like? What sort of arguments come in there? For anti regulation, well, I see that as That's, you know, we'd, we'd say free market people. So what, what would that look like? Uh, would there be high competition? Well, you'd hope so. You'd hope high competition in both scenarios. So the free marketers are basically saying that um, regulation just kills innovation. It kills value. Uh, let the market work out work it out for itself because if you've got non unperforming companies or companies trying to um, con their customers then the market works them out and they tend to disappear and all that's left are hard working um, really community minded companies that you can trust what do you think of that kind of view Do you think there's something to it, or do you think that's fairy stories? Oh, uh, it seems a bit. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that would work in completely no regulation. I thought there would still have to be a some sort of minimum standard of regulations. Yeah, and what we found that um, you know there have been times in history, particularly in the Ameri in the United States, who are much more free market than we are here in Australia. That when they do a period of intense deregulation, which means they're moving towards free market and the government is getting out of the regulatory area, uh, then you quite soon you have massive corporate frauds happening. So as it turns out, if you give people an opportunity to become a scoundrel, then guess what, they become scoundrels. On the other hand, uh, the argument that regulation puts a break on innovation and all it does is suck the life out of the economy, there is evidence for that as well. So, as usual, I think the reality probably sits around the middle ground. So, it's probably sitting where you are, Nicholas. Well done. Uh, but, of course, uh, to sit in the middle, you need to understand what's going on at either extreme so that you know why you're sitting in the middle. Make sense? Yep. Okay, so that's a that's a, a, a really interesting area of accounting theory. It well, to be honest, it's more economics. Um, but don't tell them that we pinch some of their theories. Um, if we say that standard setting is a political process, why would we say that? When we're talking politics here, we're not talking strictly Labor versus Liberal. Well, politics exists to serve various interest groups, doesn't it? Yeah. So you can imagine, for example, uh, to use the Australian political landscape, you know, people might think of the Liberal Party as serves big business, the banks, and maybe uh, you know, small business as well, whereas um, the left, the, the Labor side of politics might serve uh, working people, people who are uh, less well off and so on. And so they have constituencies, people who support them. And so... Uh, there's no doubt that standard setting occurs in a political environment. 
but it's it's more than uh, left versus right or Labor versus Liberal and so on. It's about politics here means that uh, people are either serving interest groups or perhaps they're serving themselves. And so this can distort the whole process. Um, so, for example, there's a big debate going on in Australia at the moment about um, self-funded retirees and some of the tax benefits they get out of um, fully frank dividends. Now, without trying to get into the rights or the wrong of that argument, uh, it's all about various interest groups having a say. So you've got retirees on one side versus um, people who are more likely to live on a government pension on the other. And so when we discuss the political process about standard setting, it's trying to get, get you to uh, realise that uh, accounting is not just done by the accountants and it's not just for the accountants. We all live and work in a political environment. So there are interest groups and power brokers who are involved in the process. And so what we've, what we've got there in module two uh, is there to help you uh, to uh, come to an understanding about all the different pressures that come to bear on the process of setting accounting standards. So I think you've both got, um, uh, you know, you're both well on your way and uh, I'm hoping that you're going to find the, the term a lot more interesting uh, than maybe you imagined it would be at the start. Uh, before you both nod off to sleep, um, let's have a quick look at the assessment. Do you want to do that? Oh yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Uh, I woke you up there. <laughs> That's a good, always a good way to wake people up. Okay, so you know you've got one as, one assignment and one exam. Simple? Yep. Yep. Okay, so have you had a look at the um, assignment yet? Only a brief look. I didn't go into detail too much reading it. I uh, skimmed uh, over it. Um, here we go, we're back with one of my favorite companies, Qantas. So Qantas has been in the news lately. Uh, people have been saying, oh, Qantas hasn't paid tax for years. And the people at Qantas say, yeah, well, there's a very good reason for that because we had a whopping great big loss a few years ago and the law allows us to hang on to the tax credits from that. So there's a um, couple of news articles here to get you started bit of reading here for you so they, they're links to news articles. So here's what you need to do. Research and report on the reasons why Qantas paid no tax in the previous financial year. What are their predictions on when they will commence paying tax again, if ever? So that's the research and report that you need to do. Choose any of the two following accounting theories. Conceptual framework, there you are, normative theory. Positive accounting theory, or known as PAT, legitimacy theory, or stakeholder theory. And note that when we get to stakeholder theory in the book, there are actually two theories. One of them is more to do with the, with the study of ethics, and the other one, called um, the managerial branch, uh, is similar to positive accounting theory. It's a positive theory. So choose two of those theories. Got that? Yep. Now, for each of your two, two chosen theories, do a literature review. Now, do you know what a literature review is? So, it's quite simply a review of the literature. So, the literature here is uh, academic research out of the databases in the library uh, and uh, news reports that you can get off the web. Just don't do what um, the average D grade student does and that just do a Google search and just use whatever comes up on the first page. Okay, do some proper research. 
Uh, so a, a literature review simply summarises the views of all the people in that, the key people in the key items of that literature. So you've got to make judgment about what you're going to use for your review. Don't just use the, the first articles that come to the top of your search. Think critically and work, weed out what you're going to use from what you're not going to use. Summarise the views. That is your literature review. So a good example of a literature review um, is each chapter of your textbook. So in each chapter, um, he's not trying to solve a problem. He's not trying to uh, impress you to do something specific. What he's doing is he is summarising all the relevant literature for the topic of that chapter and presenting it to you for you to read and make your own judgment, correct? Yeah. Okay, here's a tip for you. At the end of each chapter, like this one, for example, there's a reference list. Yeah. And they're all the articles that were in his literature review. So, very good starting point for chasing up academic research. So you don't have to bring up the the um, the search box on the library database and go, oh, what am I going to find? What am I going to type in? Just see if you can find some of those articles there that are relevant to what you want to do. So that's a really good shortcut for you. And that's all a literature review is. And there are some uh, really useful uh, resources put up on the Moodle site to help you with that. Uh, so, for each of your chosen theories, perform a literature review that covers the history of the theory. So you're going to do a literature review on each theory and the benefits of that theory. Identify which one of those is most suitable for explaining why Qantas paid no tax. And apply that theory. So first of all, you're going to review two theories. Work out which one is the best fit for explaining the quantum situation. Then use that theory to explain the quantum situation. We got that? Yep. Okay. yep. And then the rest is what to submit. So executive summary, introduction, there's your report, and then a conclusion and reference list. Easy as that. And there's, there's our marking rubric down there. Uh, that's your assessment and then of course you've got the exam at the end of term and uh, during week 10 I'll put up an exam uh, study guide for you. Okay, so we're coming to the end. Um, I propose that we probably have another one of these around about uh, week six. Uh, so, any questions? Oh, no. Uh, things you might find useful in uh, in Moodle. Uh, for each module, uh, you've got um, a lesson. Now that that's just uh, stepping through elementary points and with with a little bit of a quiz in there. That's not accessible. It just helps you to check your knowledge. You've got the workshop. Uh, we've done some of those questions tonight. Uh, these are not self-marking questions. So write, some, write an answer in there, submit, and it comes to me. Uh, and I'll go through and review and send you some feedback. Uh, and then you've got mini lectures, which is, um, each module broken up into its learning objectives with cut down videos and slides. So just if you, I know that you love watching me and I look very much like um, uh, well, any Hollywood character you can think of. Um, and if you can't get enough of me tonight, you can watch me again on these uh, mini lectures. 
So there's plenty of resources on there. And of course, um, you can phone me or send me an email anytime you like. So before I press stop recording, again, um, any final questions? Oh, no. How about so, you, Susan? Oh, with the um, activities that you were just showing us, is there, you can go back and do those questions again. I know I, tr I tried, did them once on the Moodle, to, uh, like on the second week, and when I went back to do it, it wouldn't let me go back through those questions. Yes. Yeah, on the I think, activities. Yeah, I think they're just set to, to do once. Uh, although, um, I think when I set them up, I think some later ones I found a way of actually um, setting them up in Moodle so that you could redo them. Uh, but they're, they're, they're really complicated things to set up in Moodle. And um, if I go in there and start tinkering, the whole thing will probably fall down again. It's like trying to build a house of cards. Because I know with the week one, I could go back and, and redo them, like do it as a review um, of the information from the previous week and redo it on week one, but week two said that nah, you're blocked out. So you're right. saying that some weeks are blocked and some are not? Or? Well, it's, it's a while since I've gone through these now. I've learnt, I learnt the hard way, what to, for good or for bad, to leave them alone. Uh, but if you want to send me an email with a specific situation like that, uh, can you do that? Send me an email and I'll see what I can do. Yep. Because yep. Moodle's a pretty ugly monster behind the scenes. You think you fixed something and you just opened up another problem. Uh, but if you, yep. if, you, if you send me a request uh, to look at something, I'll, I will look at it. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll okay. Do, right. I'll send her an email about any questions. Yeah. Okay. And did you find this workshop useful? Yeah, it's um, yeah it helped to probably unravel some confusion that I have. <laughs> yep. Uh, I th I think with this kind of unit, it just helps to be able to talk to someone. It's difficult to just read it. Yes, it does. Talk yeah. to someone. And so, um, you know, don't wait until uh, the next one. Uh, if, you, if you're confused, maybe just give us a call. May, you know, uh, I'm not always at my phone, but if you send me an email and say, can we talk, we can arrange uh, the best time for both of us so we can have a, a, have a chatter over the phone. Um, and same for you, Nicholas, or you can come and see me or you can have a chat to me after the auditing, the, the auditing session. Okay. Yeah, no worries. All right, guys. Well, um, I'm going to stop recording now. Here we go. Three, two, one.